Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Pascal's triangle and the cuneiform version of Pascal's triangle and other things that spin off of that. So there's this binomial theorem that we all are supposed to know and love. It tells you what x plus y to the n is. So you get all sorts of powers of x and zero off to n. You get all sorts of powers of y. So the powers add up to n. And then you get coefficients. And those coefficients are these binomial coefficients that we've been talking about. And the, you can think about calculating those binomial coefficients using this formula, where you just start out with x plus y to the zero, and then keep multiplying it by x plus y and see what you get. So x plus y to the zero is a monomial whose only coefficient is one. Then when you multiply it by x plus y, you get x plus y, and so you get a term with an get a term with an x in it and a term with a y in it. Let me uh, let me do things like this. So let me draw this chart here. So my, my hand will be labeling the rows of the chart. And then k, the power of x, will be getting bigger as we march in, in this direction. And n minus k will get bigger as we march in this direction. But here is k equals 0. And then here k equals 1. So, so this is x. This is the coefficient of x. This is the coefficient of y. I'm sorry, it's going to be backwards, but I still like this. There's a good reason. And so then if we take x plus y and we multiply by x plus y again, we take this thing and we shift it over this way, and that is multiplied by uh, y, and then we shift it over this way, multiply by x, and we add them up, so we get 1, 2, 1, as you know, and so on. And so we generate this triangle called Pascal's triangle as the coefficients of x plus y to the n. And the key fact, I guess, is that to get any entry in Pascal's triangle, you just add up, well, get almost any entry in Pascal's triangle, you, you add up the, the two numbers above it to the left and to the right. And so that's a proof that these binomial coefficients defined by means of this formula satisfy a little recursion relation. And this recursion relation, I'm going to write it like this. So n choose k is the sum of the two binomial coefficients above it, to the left and to the right. And so they're both on the row above it, so they both have an n minus 1. And if you stare at the picture a little bit, you see one of them has a k, one of them has a k minus, k minus 1. So, so that's, a famous, that's a famous fact about binomial coefficients. You can prove this way. But what we're trying to do, of course, is categorify all the mathematics. So instead of thinking about these binomial coefficients as just natural numbers, we want to think about these finite sets. And we'd like to understand this in that language. So n choose k is the collection of all k element subsets of n. Right, that's what that's what that's what it really is. Or you can think of them as D flags for a certain kind of dumb diagram. Well let's just think of them as k element subsets of n. And so what we're trying to see now is why k element subsets of n are in one, one correspondence with these kind of things. So k element subsets of n minus 1 plus k element subsets k minus 1 element subsets of n minus 1. What does plus mean when we're categorifying? Something plus. And what does that mean? Somebody who doesn't know what plus means. 
disjoint union. Disjoint union, and the character says it. disjoint union. So, in general, it's going to show off, it's called co product, or it's going to show off even more, it's called plus. But, <laughs> and I assume that Tom knows all this stuff. But, yeah, so, it's, so we're saying the collection of k element subsets of n is in one to one correspondence with the disjoint union of the so K element subset of n minus one and K minus one element subset of n minus one. So that's what would be nice to do to categorify this equation, make it into an isomorphism between sets. And so well, why is that true? It's true. In other words, there is a very nice isomorphism between the Huh? Yeah, that's a two in that isn't it? Okay. So it's not very nice. Just semi. So the idea is, if I have a, a three-element set of five, this is a typical guy, five G three. As the purpose said, if I pick a particular one of these elements. Then there's two different options for how my three element set of five could be. My three element set of five could not contain that marked special element. But then it's really just a three element set of four. Right? I mean, if we, if we don't include the, the special element, if we look at sets that don't include the special element, that's just four elements in there. And so so we've really gotten the four choose three ways to pick a three element set that doesn't contain that special element. The other possibility, so it's confusing, is we could pick one that does contain that special element. So another way to pick a three element set, how is this five element set? Pick three element set does contain that special tie, but that's just the same thing as a two element subset of the collection of guys that aren't that guy, that aren't that star guy. So, so there's so four choose three plus four choose two. And Jim Dolan explains it in a, in a much nicer way than I just did, so I'll just real quick explanation. I guess he said it's okay. So, so suppose you've got like a, a town with a bunch of kids in it, and they want to pick a town with five kids in it, and they want to pick a team to play baseball, and they want to pick a three people on the school team. And so there are two different possibilities. Suppose this star guy is the new kid on the block. Right? So there's someone who's distinguished in some way. The new kid on the block. So when they're picking the three member team, they could either pick, they could either say, uh, I don't like that new kid on the block, so we're not going to pick him. So then you just have four other kids to choose from. So you've got four choose three ways to do it without including the new guy in the block. Or you can say, well, oh, let's include the new guy in the block. Let's be nice. So now we just need to pick two other people out of the four who aren't the new guy in the block. So this is the distinction whether you include or not this smart element. I call it like the mean and the friendly. The mean and the friendly. The mean is where you don't include the new guy in the block. Friendly is the one where you do. So, so that's the categorified proof of the basic recursion formula. It sets up a one to one correspondence, and I said something like that this is a very nice isomorphism, but a perfect correctly pointed out that it's not a very nice isomorphism because the constructive, we have to break the symmetry of the situation a little bit. We have to pick this marked point. So it's not the ideally functorial proof. It makes no choices. There actually, I don't think it is any ideal functorial proof of this particular identity. You can make that choice. If I'm wrong, I hope it's wrong. So, okay, so that's that. 
So now let's cuneiform all this stuff. So instead of talking about k element subsets of n, what should I talk about? So this is the q equals 1 case, the finite set case of something. Binomial coefficients are about k element subsets of n, but then there are q binomial coefficients, and there are different. So what are they about? Are these not answering because you all know, or are these not answering because none of you know? Yeah, so k dimensional subspaces of f to the n, where n is our field, perhaps our field with q elements. So we could look at so we could look at n choose k sub q, and that's the set of k dimensional subspaces of Fn. And we can try to do the same trick. Somehow chop it up into two parts. A mean part and a friendly part, and need a lot of room here in this formula because there could be coefficients and extra complications in this case. But something like that is what we want. So we want to think about k-dimensional subspaces of f. One versus uh, the other possibility, k minus one dimensional subspace n minus one. This isn't true yet. There's a reason why there's a big blank space in front of the second term. So let me slide over here and get you to think about one. So let's just think about first. Let's think about three choose one versus two choose. One and two choose zero. Q. So fact got Q or if I want to really show off, think about it for any field F. I'll let it let it show off. So so this is the set we can analyze this either projectively or in terms of linear algebra. And I just feel like doing it like linear algebra because then well and what Chris said is exactly to the point. So it's a question of one dimensional subspace of a three dimensional space. Uh, and then here, we're for some reason talking about analyzing it in terms of a two dimensional space. So what I'll do is I'll imagine all the one dimensional subspaces of a three dimensional space, three dimensional vector space, but I'll consider what they're like relative to a choice of a certain two-dimensional subspace. So I'll pick my standard plane. And I'll try to use, so that's, that's, that's two there. Let's hold two pictures of two. And I'll try to count the lines through the origin in the three space, but in terms of two different possibilities. So what are the two different possibilities? You should answer the question. We need audience responses. So the camera can't see that the audience is just like, ah, these questions are too pathetically easy to answer. So they may be thinking that um, the opposite. We all go, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. The problem of silence is that it's this lot of interpretation. Of course, your mouth is full of the sandwich and they can't see that either. But <laughs> that's, that's another interpretation. They're, they're all eating. eating. <laughs> it's in there, it's not in Yeah, so there's two possibilities. It's in there or it's not in there. It's not fully in there. But it's not completely in there. So here, this is this possibility is what our two-dimensional subspace, sorry, our two-dimensional subspace contains this line. That's possibility one. <coughs> this is meant to be any of those possibilities. I can probably erase it because it's sort of Looks like the other possibility. The other possibility being that our that our two-dimensional subspace does not contain our one-dimensional subspace. Let me just erase this 
a little bit, it's you know, meant to be a gener generic proxy release, but in fact, these are certain implications of the non generic thing and the generic thing. So, you'll notice that it, so in this case, you have a one dimensional space and a two dimensional space. Here, we're trying to count these lines that intersect the plane only in a point. That's what this two zero says right now. Intersect the two dimensional space in a zero dimensional space. But there's not just one way for the line to intersect that zero dimensional space. We're actually getting a multiple in front of here because there are lots of ways to get a line in three space with the property that it intersects this plane in the zero dimensional space. Now, how many ways are there to have this situation occur? It should be an integer? It'll be an integer. It'll actually be a set, is what it really is, right? It's a set of different ways. Here I'm trying to show off and, and, and say the set of ways for this to occur is the disjunction of this set plus some set times some other set. In this particular set, this has one element, right? This is one way for the for the for the zero dimensional space to sit in the zero. So this is zero, but it's going to have a multiplier. It's going to be sorry. This is one. It's going to have to be multiplied by something, and that's what I want to know. See, here there's only the number of possibilities here, and it's an integer. Yeah. When our field is a finite field. Count the number of possible. Oh. Or if you want to really just show off, you can just describe to me the set of possibilities for this. So there's a whole F2 script, right? Right. The set is F2. So what you can do is you can just stick some other plane parallel to the one you've got and tell which line you hit by seeing where it hits that other plane. So we're getting an F2's worth of possibilities. So we're getting F2 times this one element set. So if you're working with the field with Q elements, you stick in Q squared. So that's an example of a deformed recursion relation, messed up recursion relation for these deformed binomial coefficients. And you want to see K is less than N. K has got to be less than N. So that because it's not on the edges of the triangle. Right, right. When you fall off the edge of the triangle, then you have to worry about Let's just do another example. Let's do three choose two. How about five choose two? I want to draw them. Uh -huh. So since we don't have the hyperspace unit set up today, I'm just going to stick to three dimensional examples. And so we have something about two choose two, possibly with some multiplier. And then something about two choose one. So here I'm trying to count the number of ways a plane can sit in two space. Plane is the origin, of course, for being linear algebra. There's lots of ways a plane can sit in three space, but we're analyzing it, analyzing those ways with respect to chosen. Picking a two dimensional subspace. Right. So, picking this plane to analyze the possibilities, that's like picking all the kids who aren't the new kid on the block. Picking the two guys who are already there. We're analyzing the possibilities with respect to that. So, so, you can analyze the possibilities for a plane in three space with respect to a chosen plane. This is saying what? Our plane is a plane. Then our plane is a plane. This is one. And it's just one way for to do that. And so that's this, this our plane is this other plane. So then the other possibility is that it's not. And then it intersects our plane in a one dimensional subspace, something like, like this. And then there are lots of possibilities. The other sort, where you have a line in, the, in our plane, and that's the two choose 
one, but time clearly it's got to be times something because there are lots of different ways this could occur. So how many, what's the set that we have to times it is now? F is a one, yeah, F. The field is something. Just one degree of freedom for this plane to wiggle back and forth the two. So that's the idea. And so now you should be able to guess what the general formula is. Can I lift seven? I mean, if you want to do it in general, of course you can get it from here, sure, but if you want to do it in general, uh -huh. you have know, N dimensional space, and then D dimensional okay. subspace. Okay, here I am. Yeah. Then this, so one of the ways is if our fix, and you fix N minus one dimensional space. So I fix an N minus one dimensional then space. Then one of the choices is it is, it contains the D dimensional space. Right, so one possibility is that our N minus one dimensional yeah. subspace already contain our K dimensional subspace. So it's already in that smaller one. So each of those possibilities occurs with multiplicity one, so to speak. You don't need to multiply that by a possibility. Yeah. These are so these are the possibilities where our K dimensional space is already in F to the N minus one. The other now, ones are where it's not. The not part is slightly problematic because the the dimension of the intersection can be but we still want to put it in one setup according to this idea. So why is that a natural thing to do? No, I, maybe we're maybe we're being a little because in the example we did, unfortunately, the <laughs> dimensions of the intersections were all. I think I like fool myself into thinking yeah, thinking I have a proof, but it's like vastly more complicated analysis involved. That's strange. But is there? Combinatorially, this can be proved. Just like that. But the pictures we do are misleading in that sense. Or my turn. They were somewhat misleading, that's true. So I didn't know. Otherwise, yeah. our plane and sorry, B plane and our subspace do not necessarily need to intersect with a fixed dimension. So how does that? Okay, so I have gotten completely stumped right now. I'm yeah. so happy. What, what was the question? What what can what can change? Even in projective geometry? Or not? Well, he's saying that the, we're counting the k-dimensional subspaces. Mm -hmm. I think probably if you think about it right, it will just disappear and stop. We're counting the k-dimensional subspaces of an n-dimensional space, mm -hmm. linear algebra. We're doing so by picking a particular n minus one dimension. Analyzing our k space relative to that. So one option was that our k dimensional subspace was already in that n minus one dimensional space. Right. The other possibility is that it's not. I think there's not any problem. The other possibility is that it's not. So, so that means that the intersection had to be k minus one dimensional. That's what the examples mislead us to believe, right? That's what they lead slash lead you into believe. It's actually true. Right. But you may worry that something about the examples is sort of degenerate. So that it seems that we were using more data than we should. Yeah, you almost fooled me, right, into thinking that my, that, that, that no, it I mean, wasn't going to be, sure that it wasn't going to work like this. Somebody. But if you think about it, you add one extra dimension to a, to your big ambient space, the most dimension of your subspace can go up to one. So that, so that the intersection has to be k minus one dimension. There really aren't okay. any other funkier possibilities where this is smaller. But this, the point is, this was essentially this was not what you were saying earlier. You were just looking at the intersection as opposed to how it goes up. But the yeah. intersection is going to have to be k minus one. Yeah. 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 So that means it's equal. Yeah. So I think my argument was actually sort of correct in the sense that it was, you think I yeah, it was correct, but you have to think harder than yeah. I was needing you to think myself about why the only two possibilities are that your k dimensional subspace here is in the smaller. 
or its intersection with its smaller thing as dimension one less. But okay. So we go home and ponder that. Yeah. So the real question for me anyway is what let me stick up there. N minus K. Sorry? N minus K. So we're supposed to have been fooled from the examples of thinking that was the pattern that the amount of the, the number of degrees of freedom of wiggle room you have, and here we have two degrees of freedom, here we have one. That amount of wiggle room is just the co-dimension, that is the big dimension minus the smaller dimension here. Which is also the same as the big dimension minus the smaller dimension here. So we yeah, have to like draw some graphs. Cross the pictures of planes, and do some algebra. So that's how it works. So, okay, so then D times are fine. That is, when our field is just a field of Q elements, we can count them. Did I miss anything? Different sets. And we get this recursion relation for the Q binomial coefficient. That's our encouragement. So now let's think a little bit about what this pastel is trying to actually get the light in this satisfying this relation. So it's still true that there are ones along the edges. There's only one way to think of zero dimensional space or an n dimensional space. Inside your dimensional space. So we still get the order line of, of one. But we've got a more fancy recursion relation than before. Because of that power of Q that shows up. So let's work out some of some of them. So the power that shows up here is Q to the n minus k. So it'd be nice to really be able to stare at this chart and like instantly see in each entry what n minus k is. Are you right there to base q? Uh no, I wasn't going to. Maybe I should, but maybe you should. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, then when I write q, it will look like scan. <coughs> <laughs> I don't like that. But maybe that's fine. Uh, so so here's, I don't have to use base Q over Q, do I? So here n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, 3, oh my dear, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I want to go up to n equals 4 because 4 choose 2 is our favorite binomial coefficient. That's the thing that we calculated. First, Jim calculated it by seeing how many different ways a two element set could relate to a flag and a four element set. Then I calculated it in the Q form version by drawing all the possibilities. Then I showed that those were like different ways of getting row echelon forms for two by four matrices. So that's our favorite final form coefficient for uh, Okay. So, so that is the choices of n. As I said before, here are the choices of k. So k is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. But because n is going to always be k plus n minus k, because n minus k is measured by which slicer in like this. So the n minus k is 0, n minus k is 0. 1, and on this case, 2, and so on. Okay, so that's, so that's how it works. And so each entry in here is going to be the sum of two entries above it, but weighted by this q to the n minus k in one case. So like if I pick this entry here, it would be the sum of these two guys above it, but one of them is going to get multiplied by q to the n minus k. One of them is going to get multiplied by q to the one. Which one is it? Which one is it? So, let's think 
cubes, and some of these two, but one of them is going to get multiplied by cubes. Is it this one or is it this one? We just got to get ourselves a script now. The next one. The next one? Oh, wait, no, no, it's the first one. It's the first one. Yeah. First one? Yeah. So, so this here is the one where k is one less. Yeah. So going up this way makes k one less. So this gets multiplied by cubes. So I'll just take a little q in there. Here we just multiply this by one. Right. So we're multiplying by q there. So here we get one plus q, or q plus one. Oh, Eleven. Sorry? Eleven. Eleven, if you are in a rush. I don't want to write it. <laughs> Someday it would be very nice to write it like that. It would be a lot of fun. I don't know why. Um, so let's see. So here, for example, what what are these multipliers here? Q squared. Q squared squared here, and one. one. Yeah. Okay. So the way it works is that there's always a one in front of this term. So apparently the way it works is that as we march in down and to the to the left, we always have a one. So those are the when we march down to the right, that the multi non trivial multipliers show up. And so here we got Q, so that Q, that's Q to the n minus k, which is 1. So here we, we'll get Qs all along this line. Oh, okay. Here we'll get Q squared. So, so there were 1s on that other one? Here are Q Qs. These are, this is a 1. But, but also the third, you know, the, the rightmost thing is all one. There's some degenerate cases that are nice. Yeah, so this is really all ones. We're flirting with danger, living close to the edge. And then here, these are all one ones also. For a these are all Q to the zero. So, so if, if you like, go over there. So that's how it works, and then I guess you can actually work out what we get. So we get q squared plus 1 plus q, and no, it's an ascending order, 1 plus q plus p squared. Here we get q times 1 plus q plus 1. So we get 1 plus q plus q squared. Now here we get q cubed plus 1. So it's 1 plus One? No, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Q, Q plus one times all that stuff. So it's one plus Q plus Q squared plus Q Q. This is the big nasty one, the beautiful fun one. So we get one plus Q plus Q squared plus the same thing times Q squared. So we get one plus Q plus Q squared, and then we have another Q squared, we get two Q squared. And that you're supposed to know and love. We've seen this thing about 50 times now. So this is the ordinary binomial coefficient down here is 6. But this is some worked version of 6. It has six different terms, but with different powers of Q. Uh, and those are the sizes of these Bruja cells that we talked about. And then this is Q times. That plus one of this plus one plus q plus q squared plus q cubed. Okay, so there's a little bit of the q Pascal triangle. So what are some of the things that one notices about this that are mildly things that aren't obvious but seem to be working out? Symmetric? Yeah. So one thing that's sort of shocking in a way is that it's symmetrical, at least so far. This is equal to this, this is equal to this, and so on. And from this very asymmetrical looking recursion relation, it's not so obvious to me. I'm just going to find it being symmetrical. So that's actually something that we're going to tackle next time. We're going to try to prove the, the symmetry property of the Q binomial coefficient. And we really want to, as usual, try to prove it in a categorified way. So that symmetry is saying something. Um, there's an easy way to prove it, and it's a beautiful way to prove it. So, I mean, uh, well, okay, I won't talk about that. You can already see some ways to prove that, perhaps. But 
Plus, it's it's also true that each individual entry is symmetric. Did we already mention that? Right. We did mention that, yes. I mentioned last time that every Q multinomial of coefficients, not just these Q binomial coefficients, is a palindrom uh, palindromial, it's a palindromic polynomial. Yeah. So that we actually proved last time by proving it for the by proving it for the how did we do it? You only need to prove it for the two binomial coefficients because all the multinomial coefficients are part of the product. We didn't say it. We may not have ever said we know we have some secret sessions yeah. after class or but you have to write two inverse and then it's up to the power of two inverse of them. Oh no, I said, but I, I muttered after class, so it's a really beautiful way to think about that. It's one for a two hours. Yeah. These are actually coefficients here, are really the dimensions of the cohomology of the flag manifold over the compact And then the fact that it's a manifold, compact manifold, is this one for a two hours. That's a good way to think about it. But yeah, okay, we really didn't cover that. So that's, a, that's still a, a puzzle. So there are, I guess, two symmetries. Each entry is symmetrical, and the whole chart is symmetrical. Um, those more. are, I think, the main the main puzzles I wanted to. There's one more, which if you wanted to give me trying to prove all along. Which is what? The two binomial, uh, the, the non negative uh, coefficient. Right, so we, we proved it. Did it? Sure. As soon as we checked it, that. As soon as we checked that we could count, that as soon as okay. we could check that the size of the Grassmannian is the sum of the sizes of these Bruja cells, and then say each Bruja cell is a collection of matrices with some given row echelon form, so it's f to the n. There's a certain number of little stars there in your matrix in row echelon form that can be anything. Then we proved it. And I was supposed to have proved that the Q binomial coefficients actually polynomials of natural number entries. And that implies the same thing for the multinomials too, because again, multinomials are powered for that. Yeah, sometimes these proofs are like shaggy dog stories, but by the time we get to the end of the proof, you don't remember the, the theorem. But I really did, that was my last class, I was trying to prove that theorem, and I did. Uh, so, so that's the mystery that's already been dissolved, but now it's dissolved again a different way. Now it's just obvious that all these polynomials are going to have natural number coefficients because we start with some ones and we keep multiplying them by powers of q and add them. So you're never going to get anything except polynomials that way, and they have to have natural number of coefficients. So this is another proof of that. Of that That's right. Did you know another mystery, Jim? Well, yeah, yeah, or a question, which is, I mean, for q equals one, we have the binomial theorem. It's just about you know taking a a binomial and taking its powers. Right. And the question is whether there's a huge form version of that. Right. So that's that's one thing I want to do today, right? Is to okay. actually now move up, work my way towards understanding what's the Q analog of the Q, of the binomial formula, essentially. Um I want to slowly slide my way over there by noting something else which is that, let's see, well, it won't destroy you if I move over no. here. So I'm going to want to refer occasionally to the form, the Q to form Pascal's triangle. But let me just a second think about the ordinary Pascal's triangle. So in the ordinary Pascal's triangle, if you don't have all these Qs around, Each entry in the triangle, because it's the sum of the two entries <coughs> above it, so let's not worry about one over here. Because it's the sum of the two above it, you can think of it as counting the number of paths starting at the top and working all the way down. So, so for example, here we get we get three because. Well, why? Because 3 is 2 plus 1. And there's one path from the top to that 1. But there are two 
like that where you drop balls on the top and they sort of randomly go left to right at each stage and then they fall into a big pile on the bottom and then you see that you get a roughly Gaussian distribution of walls at the bottom because the binomial coefficient approaches a Gaussian function. Uh, and I'm supposed to make you enlightened about the relationship between e to the negative x squared and, and all this common parts and how like the fact that people's intelligence is roughly distributed over the particle bell curve, maybe it's the result of like tons of little genetic traces that they, that they that are, that are possible. So lots of small uh, effects can add up kind of randomly to give a normal distribution. So okay, so that's that's a very nice bunch of ideas, and so it's nice to think about how all those ideas cute form, what happens in the cute form case. So if I consider the same kind of picture here, but but think about the our Q the form version of it, let's let's just see what what happens. So you know, let's do the exact same little example. So now so what you're seeing is that if I if I look at any point in this triangle in the classical bus system, the number of ways to get from there, there is. The number of ways to march from the top of the triangle down to a given point where you're at each stage of your path will have to move either left or right. Is and choose. Is and choose K. Huh? Because you, you have to move because, 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 because over here. Because you have K choices of, you have to move K times all the right, yeah. and you have to move N minus K times to the left. And then each stage is bit like And then each stage, you get the choice. So there's all the ways of picking a K element set out of an A. Element because, in, because instead of calling them left and right, you call them X and Y. I'm going to. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm also going to call them okay. mean and friendly, <laughs> or in and out for these if you're thinking about the neighborhood keeps growing and you keep getting to decide whether the new kid on the block gets to be in the team or not. I don't want to try to do universal <laughs> theory here. How everything is related to everything. So so but I, let's think about what's going on in the Q to form version. So here I was writing these multipliers that we that we have. We I won't write the multipliers that are one. I don't write anything that means one. So if I'm trying to figure out this Q binomial coefficient, so I now consider all the ways to get from the top to the entry I want to reach, but I now have to weight them by these multipliers. So I can go this way, and this way, and this way, but that's multiplying by one in each stage, so I just get a one. Or I could go this way and then to the left and then to the right. And what do I get from that term? Swing trigger weight. So we're counting these tabs as weighted. So that gives me Q. That that half there gives me a factor of Q. And then there's the other possibility, which is to go in to the left first, and then to the right first, and that would be two equals of two squared. So, so what's, what we're doing here is we're counting paths, but we're counting them weighted by a certain power of Q. And we want to understand very vividly what that power of Q really is telling us. So maybe I will. 
Next, I will draw those. That may be too simple. Uh, let's just do that one. So, so we have this path, which is giving us a one. And this path. giving us a Q, and we have this path, which is giving us a Q squared. I don't know if this is enough data for your pattern recognition clicking, so I want you to be able to like, give me a quick and easy rule where I can just like, look at this path and say, oh, that's going to give me a Q to thus such and such. But this may not be enough choices for you. Okay, let's do let's do a little a few more. Let me let me go down to our favorite entry in the, in the binomial table down here. So here we have a multiplier of Q squared. And there'll be lots of terms here, but we can fix things we have data. But let me just do a couple of them. Okay. So so one possibility for a path is to say go Let's, 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 we, can, we can take the left, I want to go left as far as I can until I have to go right. So I'll go this way, and then I'll come down here. So that's this path here. Bing, bing, bing. Now what do I get out of that path? Q to the fourth. Q to the fourth. You pick up cars with Q when you go to the right. Uh, but some of these, of course, pick up different cars with Q, depending on when you go to the right. That's giving us two to the fourth. Let's do another one. So let's say I go to the right. Sorry, did I say that? And go to the left. I'm, I can't tell the difference between the left and right. That's a problem. We go to the left, and then we go to the right. Then we go to the left, and then we go to the right. So left, right, left, right. My dad is. That song, all the way So, I'm really not there a song on the folder. So, so, so what can we get? Q, Q. Okay, let's, so you should be seeing what the pattern is, but let's just do another one. Let me say I go right, left, right, left. Right, left, right, left. So the idea is, if you want to get as big of a power of Q as possible, what should you do? You should go to the lay the right. Yeah. So it's like you want to go to the left as much as you possibly can, and then all right, come on, you have to. That's right. So, so putting off going to the right is what determines. So now let's try to make that a little bit more precise. So how can we just look at this thing and say, and say, oh, it's four because some fact about that shape. It has to be very big because you like that first thing. No, 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 no one's seeing oh. that Jim who already oh, okay, doing okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What the purple, what is it? Complete the draw the other draw the thing that is written for one. Draw the thing that is written for one. Any figure, draw the thing that is written for one. So no, draw the sort of outline of what yeah. of what where your path is only the path maybe I'll draw that in Gothic way. Yeah. Your path is always trapped inside a rectangle, which in this particular case you don't draw that. What? You don't draw that either. Well, I'm certain. But I know what you're saying. 
the path is always stuck inside this reference angle. The k by n minus k, right? You have to go left uh, n minus k times and to go right k times in your turn. It's the number of boxes above the solid line. To the right of the solid line, not above. The yeah. So, so, so there are four boxes there, three boxes here, one box here. So that's the rule. And and the way you can think about it here is that whenever you go right, you suddenly you close a bunch of boxes. Something forced you to close a whole bunch of boxes above and to the, to the right of them. And here, when, as soon as we made this right turn, we added two boxes to our to our to our region. So we got a huge square. So what so the so the idea is that you can maybe I'll just maybe I'll just draw a big fancy example here just to Supposed to all be so obvious it doesn't require any proof, but sort of after you thought about it. So, so, so like if I was doing a five choose two, so k is two, so I have to go twice to the right, and then three times to the left in my journey from the top to my final resting point here. So here, k is 2, n minus k is 3. I'll answer the question in a second. Okay. And so you have lots of ways to get from here down to here. If I take a particular way, say, that, that way there will of course, we'll have four boxes here, so I should take two to the fourth. But why? Well, it's because the multipliers that I pick up when I go to the right, here it's Q, and here it's Q, 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 Q. And, and those numbers, Q to the one and Q to the three, they're just the number of boxes in each of the rows of this diagram. If we tilt our head, think of these as the rows. So we're just counting the number of boxes by adding up the number of boxes in each row. Yeah. Well, you almost you almost just answered my question. My question it's not an interesting question because they can't remember the answer. That if I stand at a forty five degree angle, then these picture you just talk about rows, you talk about a diagram with rows, uh, you're making it sound like a young diagram, right? Yes. So this is a the time. first of some number of what you might call strange loops that occur in our reasoning. So we were using Young diagrams all the time for all sorts of things. And for example, we use Young diagrams to describe flag varieties or Grassmannians. So Grassmannians correspond to Young diagrams that have two rows. And this is another appearance of Young diagram. It's like seemingly completely unrelated to that because here we're studying Grassmannians counting points in Grasslandians, and to count them, we need to think about Young diagrams, but they could have various numbers of those. Nothing to do with the Young diagram, but it started out thinking about it. So, maybe. Quote yes. question. <laughs> of course, whenever you walk around your house and come back and see the same tree again, and it looks like a completely different tree because you're seeing it from some new angle, you have to consider the possibility that if you had some better understanding of the overall landscape, you could see, understand why you were seeing that same tree again. Uh, but this one's subtle enough so that it's not obvious that it's really the same thing again. But let me try to formalize what we've said here so far. So one thing we're saying is that n choose k, it's the number of young diagrams of a certain sort. We said that n choose k is the number of paths from here down to here. But each path is giving us a shape that we can, if we view it from a suitable angle, looks like a young diagram. Of course, a cone one. Which a cone one, that's right. A 
of course, which one it looks like depends on how you rotate your head. So there's a certain symmetry involved. But I'll say that this is the number, the number of cone Young diagrams of a certain sort. So, for example, this particular one here, I may want to rotate it or reflect it or something so that it looks like this. Home young diagrams have the, the most rows at the top and then shorter that's the most the longest rows at the top and then shorter rows as you go down. So I'm doing some kind of symmetry that turns it into that. And you might have wanted to pick some other symmetry, but it's not going to ultimately matter. But there's a nice staircase profile, no, no going back up and down, right? Right. So, so, right. so this kind of thing would be a sort of a general home young diagram. It's already been row echelon. Already been a row echelon, yeah. Uh, so you're giving away some secret function, right? Oh, but accidentally. Okay. Because we were talking about that too. Right? So everything is all related. Right? But anyway, so comb young diagrams, but what what class of combed young diagrams are we actually counting? What's the so here's an example of one. And it depends what class it is, of course, on the fact that the N is Five here and B is two. Size B plus and minus B. Size, let's say, yeah. So let's say with less than or equal to K, your K is two. Less than or equal to K columns. And at least equally one. And less than or equal to K rows. Oh, I think it's just that. So in other words, I'm saying that this young diagram has to fit into a two by three box, which was this two by three rectangle view from an angle before. <laughs> and so I can't have more than two columns or more than three rows. But apart from that, it would be any. So that's that's a fact. Um, but then we have less than or equal to K rows or less than or equal to N minus. N oh, minus sorry, 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 sorry. N minus K rows. Nice. That's right. That's right. So your K is two. N minus K is three. So we're getting all sorts of young diagrams. <laughs> But we're getting much more than just that fact because we're getting not just the formula for the ordinary binomial coefficients in terms of thinking of these pictures. We're really understanding something about the q deform binomial coefficients. q deform binomial coefficients, as we're seeing, are a sum over these zigzag paths. But each of those zigzag paths, we're now calling it a Young diagram. So the q deform binomial coefficients. will be a sum over, uh, over these Young diagrams. So let me just write such Young diagrams. Such Young diagrams. Of Terms. So, for example, this particular Young diagram here is giving us the term Q to the fourth. Right? That's what we're getting for this one. And then we'd add up all the others and get the cars of Q or something. That's the thing we're adding up. So, what is it that we're adding up? What was it like? Weighted paths? Oh, man. Sorry? Weighted paths? Well, these Young diagrams are just another name for paths. Uh -huh. right? this, this Young diagram, when I say such Young diagrams, I mean Young diagrams are combed with no more than K columns and no more than N minus K rows. So here's one. We're calculating the Q binomial coefficient by adding up something over all those Young diagrams, so i.e. over all those paths. And I just want to know what's the sum in them. 
Q to the Q to the something Q to the area, or if you're talking in Young diagram lingo, number. Q to the number of boxes. No, Q to the number of boxes of your Young diagram. So this box, Young diagram, has four boxes, so it's a Q to the four. Your question. This should be okay. It should be obvious. I mean, I'm true. And then you go to partition function. Oh, okay. You're trying to understand what it really means. Yes. That's not what you have to say. That's right. It is like a partition function in physics. If you think of a physical system whose states correspond to the young diagrams, and there are indeed such systems, that would be like a bunch of little clothes on this. Then you can try to think about physical interpretations to put this. Okay. That's a good kind of puzzle. Yeah. But at least the truth of this statement should be. Be obvious. Okay, so one other thing. So when we were when we were studying the number of points in a gross monument. I introduced this idea of row echelon form. It turns out the technical term is reduced row echelon form. That each row starts with a one or ends with a one. So I looked up stuff about row echelon form. That's the technical term. But anyway, you need the math thing to you think. No, no, I look at a very sophisticated sort of information on that class to find stuff. Wikipedia. So, um, so, so, so we were we were looking at four Q two sub Q, right? That was our that's the thing I spent several days calculating. And so we saw what it was: one plus Q plus two Q squared plus Q Q plus Q to the four. We just saw it again today. And what we what we were doing back then is we were saying, okay, this is Rossmannian of two dimensional subspaces of a four dimensional space. And we're trying to take that gross money and chop it up into Bruhan cells and count how many guys are in this Bruhan cell and add them up. And so, for example, one of our Bruhan cells was something like this. All so what did we do? We took a basis of our two-dimensional subspace in F to the four. One possibility is something like this. I could take my first basis vector to look like that. I'm not done messing with this, but this, this will be saying, remember what we're doing here. We're looking at our two-dimensional subspace and analyzing how it intersects with our favorite zero-dimensional space, and then with our favorite one-dimensional space, and our favorite two-dimensional space, and our favorite three-dimensional space. And then we fix our favorite flag study an arbitrary two-dimensional subspace relative to that one. And so we can say, okay, does our first case inspector does it live in the one-dimensional subspace? No. Does it live in the two-dimensional subspace? No. Does it live in the three-dimensional subspace? Yes. So it must be a vector of form blah, 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 zero. We can normalize it. Look like this. Then we look at our second case inspector, and then again, there are all sorts of choices. And one possible choice would be no, 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 yes. I think that's the only possible choice. Mm -hmm. Then we get to fiddle around with this thing a little bit to make this simplify as much as possible. Right? Mm -hmm. Column operation, uh, row operation. So we got a certain row echelon form. And so there's a collection of two dimensional subspaces of F to the 4 that have basic put into this form, and that's a Bruja cell. And that Bruja cell there, because it has four unknowns, is like the one we have to the four. So it's the one that's giving us this Q to the four. Here. Four stars there. So, so this, this row echelon form corresponds to this term here. Now, in terms of our principles triangle, 
the Q to the 4 is one of the terms we get when we calculate the entry of the Pascal's triangle here, the Q to form Pascal's triangle. So I can get it over on there. And each of these terms, which you really think of this as two different terms, each of these terms comes from a certain zigzag path. So which zigzag path are we using that gives us Q to the fourth? All the way left and then right. So, so we saw that that's the path that makes this box here have area four, right? This young diagram here has area four. So in terms of the Pascal's triangle, the Q to the fourth term corresponds to this path here. In terms of the Bruja cell, it corresponds to this kind of row echelon form. What's going on? Okay, don't answer. I'll do another one. Okay, I'll just do another one. So let's 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 let's, let's I can start here. I started with the row echelon form. I figured out the power of Q, and I sort of figured out which mass that has to be. But let's do something tricky. Let's go the other way. Let's not do like in this case here. We made more. So for this case, there are two different young diagrams with two boxes that I can fit in here apparently. So let me take one. So let's say go here, and then here, and here, and here. Okay, so that particular zigzag path gives me a box here, um, a young diagram with area two. So that's contributing to So now let's, well, let's see. So I want you to figure out, I guess, which Bruja cell that corresponds to. Right? Which type of row echelon form. I guess that's what, what you got yourself into here. But I'm saying there's some kind of row echelon form for a basis of a two-dimensional subspace in that form that goes along with this particular path here. I think I can sort of see it, but I get confused by the symmetry convention. Okay. So, remember how... Okay, maybe I'll say it this way. We're trying to wind up in the two-dimensional subspace of F to the four. And we're trying to describe it with respect to our favorite flag, which is a favorite one-dimensional space, and a favorite two, and a favorite two. So I can take my two-dimensional, I can take a two-dimensional space, and I can see how it intersects with my zero-dimensional subspace, my one, my two, Three, four. And we know that by the time we intersect it with the whole four dimensional space, we get some two dimensions. We're looking at a two dimensional space. But its intersection with the zero dimensional space of the one, or the two, or the three, it can be different things. It has to climb its way up to two. And I think the way it works. is that when we go to the left, it increases, and when we go to the right, it doesn't. Or maybe the other way around. So, so, so look what happens. Look what happens in this example. So, so in this example, we have this two-dimensional subspace spanned by these vectors. What's the intersection of this two-dimensional subspace What's the dimension of the intersection with our favorite one-dimensional space? That is, what's our favorite one-dimensional space? Because of course, the space spanned by our favorite first space inside. Take the two-dimensional subspace and intersect it with the two-dimensional space spanned by these guys and intersect it with this. What dimension do you get? Zero, right? Because it's got to have all the non-zero numbers. So it's zero. So it's this two-dimensional space has zero intersection with our one-dimensional subspace. 
So this apparently means that it's like out. It's not not in, in other words, it's not not getting any vectors from here that are in the one dimensional subspace and by this. I'll just call that out. So it doesn't out. Then I ask, okay, what's the dimension of our two two-dimensional space intersected with our favorite two-dimensional Space span by these. What's the dimension of the intersection of the span of these and the span of these? Still zero. Because you're never going to get that. Okay, so, so we're still out. We're still not putting any vectors. We're already up to this two dimensional subspace, and we still don't have any vectors in our two dimensional subspace. So we're not getting any new stuff in there. Then we draw in our next one. And now what's the dimension of the intersection? One. Because this vector is there. So now we're saying, okay, now we have one vector, one dimension for the vectors here is there. And then finally, when we get to the whole four dimension, of course, we get two. So in this particular example, we are putting off including vectors, so to speak, as late as possible, and then we have to, have to do it all the last. Whereas in this example, it's more exact than the example, apparently we're putting one in from the very start. So the very first chance we have to put a basis vector in, again, a non trivial intersection or two dimensional subspace, space span by the basis vector, we do. So put that in. And then we say, no, I don't want anything else to come in. No, I don't want anything else to come in. Oh, yeah, I better let them come So, So I don't put that in that way. I don't put that in that in that way. I put, postpone it. Postpone making the intersection with my standard flag B to the last minute. And so I get something, I get a basic sort of like this. Can you, can you say that you? Building your subspace basis vector by basis vector at each step, staying as far away from your chosen flag as possible. In this so, example, in this first example. Right. Yeah, that was oh, right, right. Right. That was because you have no example, choice but to run into it. to the four, sometimes called the generic Bruja cell. It's the biggest Bruja cell, the highest dimensional Bruja cell. And that's because we're not making our two-dimensional subspace have any specially nice relationship to our standard flag, so, so it has the most wiggle room as possible. Whereas here, we're getting something much subtle. I'm not done. This <laughs> isn't in row echelon form yet, but, 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 uh, but I'm putting something in the first opportunity I can, and I'm saying, no, no, yes. Of course, when I put it in row echelon form, I get to do some row operations to simplify it. So why do like that? Okay, so I'm saying this path here corresponded to this type of row echelon form, or this one zigzaggy path corresponds to this. Okay, now you have two examples. You can obviously tell me what's the pattern here. What's the pattern that you just see? How does okay, so in the first example, we're taking that path. Getting that. Second example, something about the accident. Something about the accident. Good. Don't get this too much of it. That's just the right amount. Downward and left arrows are the south. Accident. Down and right arrows, you have to do one and back to the other. Well, you guys are like trying to completely figure it out even more than I ever have. Maybe that's why it's taking so long. This is to this, and this is to this. What's the most rightfully visible pattern there? I think you said it, but like cloaked in so many layers of more sophisticated. The left arrows give you stars, the right arrows give you one. There are, well, okay, you're way, way ahead of me. I was just thinking something much more stupid than that. This little TYG box, that is that. That's those asterisks. Um, this little 
two by one thing is that. In other words, if you take your rho echelon form, and you only look at the asterisks, and you turn them into a Young diagram, into the rows of a Young diagram, you get the same Young diagram that you got from the other method. Those asterisks are like degrees of freedom. And somehow that corresponds to the area. Yeah, that's right. So maybe I should leave some of the puzzle. Uh, I should quit now. I'll quit now so we can get the really cool part. But this is already. So you should just think about this and see. 